part of the panel, which is a discussion uh, section. So I think before we, we start, uh, just a recap, uh, I think we have been uh, hearing this morning about many interesting concepts that will form part of the futures today, uh, of, the fu for, of the future networks. We have been talk hearing talking about heterogeneous networks, green networks, uh, different spectrum handling uh, models. Uh, we have been Talking also about the evolution of what will come after LT advance and the need for higher uh, hierarchical and capillarity networks. Um, I think it's a very good opportunity now to, to, to start uh, this discussion and we have a panel of experts here, so I encourage everyone to, to be active on, on placing questions. Before we start with questions from the floor, I think, Misa, you wanted to, to make an, uh, a remark? <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, I would like to be the black sheep, really, and. Um, also, not only experts are here, but actually the experts are in the, in the room. <clears throat> um, having heard the talks and, uh, you know, having seen the titles of what is coming today and tomorrow, um, let, me, let me say that I think we're doing as a community pretty poorly, okay? I think uh, we could be doing better than uh, what is happening to date, and I want to I quantify this right now, and, and then I want to ask you why this is the case. Now, um, we are building clearly a wireless internet. This is what we're doing, okay? Now, we are not the first one to build an internet. There were other people who have done this before. Uh, if we zoom back some 70, 70 years, uh, right after World War II, uh, one of the biggest internets on the planet was built, which is uh, the highway system in the United States, because Roosevelt understood uh, he learned that actually from, uh, from uh, Hitler, as a, as a matter of fact, that if he wants to get you know, his goods or troops from point A to point B very quickly, he needs to have a good infrastructure in place. So he started building highways between U.S. cities, which got the cars from city A to city B and back from city B to P city A. Now, back then, this was an absolutely unjustified uh, investment into an infrastructure which was uh, hopelessly overdimensioned, hopelessly overdimensioned. But what did it do? It ignited a completely new economy. We're not only talking about the car economy. One out of eight on the, on the planet is working in the car economy today. I'm talking in general about the goods, the flow, the growth of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So back then, overdimensioning, unjustified investment, and uh, an enormous economy grew. Some 40 years later, with the DARPA, et cetera, you know, we started building the internet as we know it today, uh, the electronic the information internet, and uh, the same happened again. Again, we build a network completely overdimensioned, and it has actually, you know, uh, been keeping in this trend quite, quite a lot. Um, again, it was an enormous investment cost. People have been digging up uh, trenches, putting cables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, seemingly unjustified, but again, it kicked off an economy which we know, you know, as the uh, as the internet economy today. Now, in the wireless uh, domain, we're building the wireless internet, uh, but the only thing we have been talking about the past 20 years today, and if we don't pay attention the next uh, 10 years, is uh, limited, interference limited, uh, capacity limited. For some reason, Shannon still pops up some, uh, you know, 50 years uh, after he came up with all his stuff. I think we have a problem, guys. I think we're not shooting high enough. I think we should, uh, we should really get architectures and technologies in place which don't make us worry anymore too much about the uh, capacity problems to really ignite this wireless economy, which we are trying to ignite, but it doesn't happen because we are always limiting ourselves. Uh, my iPhone, I always have to choose between wireless LAN and 3G or no data network. I don't want to do that. When I use my computer at home, I'm not uh, clicking, now I'm going to use my fiber network, now I'm using my modem. I don't do that. Nobody does it. Uh, people in the computer society think about other things. You know, real things which get us moving, applications, uh, revenues, uh, servicing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Instead, you know, we're always limited by this capacity. So I have shown you today one gigabit per second per square kilometer. Let's shoot for 10 gigabits per second per square kilometer, and, and let's let's work in an architecture to get it going. Uh, let's lobby to get the the frequency bands. Let's work on the um, 
on the front ends, which allow us to process 100 megabits per second. Let's work on, on standardized architectures which go beyond what we have today, and maybe this is going to be 5G. Today I've seen Robert put up 5G. Great, but he backed off. 30 seconds, he took it out again. We need 5G, and maybe 5G is going to be like uh, Etsy M2M, a revolution in the architecture. If you look at the architecture of Etsy M2M, there's a true revolution there. On a single slide, there appears the cellular network and the capillary network, which is wireless design, ultra wideband, Zigbee type of network. On a single architecture slide, this is unprecedented. We need something like this in the 3GPP community. You know, that wireless line is embraced, everything, all the radio access technology is embraced, it's just transparent. Let's get it going, 10 gigabits per second per hertz uh, by 2015, and I think then we are good, and then we can get, really get start talking about the wireless internet. So, uh, my question to the audience, why don't we shoot high enough? Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, Misha. I think it's a very interesting question for everyone. Uh, so, I suggest uh, we open the, the floor for for comments and, 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 and questions to the, to, the, to, the, to the panelists. So anyone has any specific question to start with? Well, if not, I will start with, 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 with one. We have been talking a lot about the spectrum. Uh, it, it, it looks to be one of the key, of the key things of, of, for the networks in the future, although we know that the capacity has increased from the from the higher number of cells and, and will kept the same way in the, in the future. Uh, we have been talking about the need of, of having much, uh, much uh, dynamic and much flexible way of handling the spectrum uh, within cellular bands and also using other cellular band, other non-cellular bands as an opportunistic uh, approach and yes, secondary licenses, etc. cetera. Uh, technology is evolving towards that uh, at, the same, at the same time, we are seeing, uh, especially in Europe, all the awards for uh, new frequency bands, 800 megahertz, 2.6 mega, uh, gigahertz frequency bands for LTE technologies, uh, awards that will last for, for, for many years and that operators are investing uh, an amount of money to, to, to acquire them. So my, fir my first question to the, to the panel is, if you close your eyes and you open them again in 2021, how do you see the spectrum scenario? Because uh, my perception is that we have been talking about cognitive radio, we have been talking about wide spaces for, for many years now, and, and probably we, we don't have, I mean, we are very far from having the flexibility we, we need in this spectrum. Uh, I guess there are some uh, major roadblocks, but I would like to hear your, your views about how spectrum scenario will look like in 2020, 2021, and, 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 and what are the things that need to happen or not happen to get to this point. Can I take that quickly? Uh, yeah, I think so. My, my gut feeling is that uh, the technology is going to be less of an issue. I think building uh, cognitive, or let's say smart radio technology that will allow you to access the already allocated primary own spectrum and put it into the network and stretch it into all what you already have, Doing that, my gut feeling is going to be easy. What's not going to be easy is how do you make that feasible to be A, amenable for investment, and to be amenable for investment, you need a certain degree of certainty of uh, access, meaning uh, you need certain well-defined rules, regulations, uh, and taking care of the political interests and the football that is going to emerge when you try to go in that direction. Uh, so it's very, very critical that the policy making has to be A, very well informed, B, has to be very swift. Because if you look at uh, the typical example of digital TV white spaces, right, the whole topic has been in play for more than six years now. It started around 2005. The first rule making happened in 2008. The most recent one happened in 2010. And even after rule making, there is no tangible market product that you are seeing, even though the push is increasingly there now to make it happen. So uh, we as a community, we need to not only create the technology, but we also need to aggressively create system uh, um, proofs, uh, at scale proofs that can be uh, pushing the policy agencies to aggressively move forward, right? And I think that's, that's often lacking on the um, uh, technology side, often lacking in the academic community 
that does research in these kind of topics. So, so as much as technology is important, pushing the, the policy uh, regulators and providing them evidence uh, is also important critical activity that we need to do. So unless that happens, uh, the progress on making more spectrum available could be rather slow, as is already uh, there. But if the customer pushes, if, if, is there, if the demand is there, and we need to satisfy the demand, and there's no other easy way, my guess is uh, that also could be another Im important force to make policy regulation relax. So. Uh, <clears throat> by 2020, I think... Um, maybe the game will be inversed. So uh, that is my, my uh, personal feeling, in the sense that today we are trying to get uh, spectrum out of the uh, TV space, and I think by 2020 it may very well be the opposite. But before I come uh, to quantifying or to say why that is the case, uh, the, the, I think the major issue is to get the front ends just work flexibly enough cheaply small low power consumption that you know they can jump around on frequencies and they can work on uh, variable bands 100 megahertz is a wide shot but 20 megahertz if we just do that i think we're good because uh, frequency chunks are just available we have enough uh, frequency and uh, to run through regulation uh, to ask uh, for global wide bands we just see it doesn't work, it's too slow. So it is quicker of digging out uh, trenches and putting cables and making the cells smaller rather than ask for a new spectrum. And the trend is just uh, confirming that. <clears throat> now, coming back to the TV stuff, I'm, I'm not a very big uh, proponent of the TV uh, white space uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that um, it turns out that if you, know, if you just harm digital TV or any TV uh, by uh, some 0 0.5 dB due to your cellular, you know, just due to adjacent interference from your mobile phones, it's a uh, order of magnitude higher revenue loss to the broadcasters and therefore due to the taxation of the government than what they get from the cellular systems. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time talking to Ofcom about that and they have also been very susceptible about it. So we have to be very, very careful of not harming the TV channels which are out there simply because they generate much more revenue than we do. The second point is that uh, it turns out that we have a lot of TV white space where we have actually no need at all to provide capacity, which are not the hot spot, but the so-called not spot, okay? So uh, in areas like downtown London, downtown Madrid, downtown Barcelona, et cetera, where we really need the capacity is where actually the white space is very, very dire. So that is the first thing, uh, the, the first two things. And the third thing is uh, the, I think the broadcast community is not sleeping. Okay, and the same way as we are going uh, undergoing the uh, wireless revolution and video streaming, etc., I think there will very shortly come uh, a wireless revolution in broadcasting, own broadcasting, own TV channels. I'm not sure anybody from France is here, so I lived in France for a for year. The, there's a company called Free, and you can have your own TV channels. Okay, so you yourself can have your own channel, and that has taken off. So I wouldn't be surprised if in, uh, in five, ten years, actually, you know, this uh, very fragmented, personalized uh, TV channeling will actually come back on the table and therefore eat, essentially, the spectrum which we're trying to offer for our services uh, back to their services. So 2020, let's see. Can I take one minute? Yeah, Robert, and after that, we'll leave you with it. Um, regarding white space, I tend to agree that white space has a little bit that tendency that it is sometimes at places where you actually don't need it. Therefore, I think another very interesting um, possibility for white space actually can be that one uses LTE infrastructure in um, single frequency transmission mode actually to broadcast um, the TV signals. We have done some studies in the United States on that in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it turns out if you use existing site grids, you actually can, I think, um, use only 30 to 40 percent of existing TV spectrum to actually provide all the TV channels that are currently broadcasted and free around 60% um, of TV frequencies for mobile broadcast. So I think that is actually a very interesting option one should try to pursue further. I had a bit of an issue with uh, your characterization that the broadcast uh, revenue is much more than the broadband cellular revenue. That's, at least in the United States, seems to be rather counter because uh, A, 
The over-the-air uh, viewership is declining rapidly in the U.S. Uh, less than 15% of the end users actually receive TV through over-the-air, right? And it's rapidly going down. And if you if you look at the dollar monetization out of a given megahertz spectrum, um, my contention is that the broadcasting revenue is going to be much smaller than a cellular broadband uh, monetization that you can uh, create, right? Uh, the second thing is uh, it being not available in places where you actually need it. Uh, sure, you could take examples of four big metros in the United States, which is San Francisco, Washington, D.C., New York, and say that, yes, available channels at four watt power is only one six megahertz channel. But even in places like New York, even in Times Square, when I look at a 40 milliwatt or 100 milliwatt transmission, there are still about six to seven channels available. And that is a substantial amount of spectrum when you want to create additional capacity in indoor settings. If I go to Grand Central Station, if I go to Penn Station, if I go to uh, all areas where there's significant amount of indoor usage, having that additional uh, spectrum which propagates very well through structures, through obstacles, is much better than having a 5.1 gigahertz solution is my personal contention. So in that sense, white space is still useful. White space, you have to always answer the question at what power you are trying to do secondary usage at. If it's lower power, I think your options start becoming better. So uh, that's us. <clears throat> well, I would, you know, I would believe on the, um, on the revenue models as long as it goes via LT network. That's not something very interesting. I didn't know about that. But otherwise, um, broad <clears throat> broadcast will always make more money for the simple reason that uh, money comes in from advertisement. Advertisement is linked to the viewers, so it's proportional to the... Uh, to the click through, essentially, the people who enjoy it, rather than the flat rate you offer on the cellular side. But uh, the game changes, I agree, if things go over the LT network, but that is a great, uh, great tendency, which probably we should capitalize on much more. Okay. And then, you know, using it indoors, it's, um, uh, you know, Ofcom doesn't like it. I can tell you. Ofcom, okay, Ofcom. But FCC Ofcom. Does, likes it even less because they introduced, uh, you know, these special models, uh, uh, the databases, etc., exactly for that reason. You know, so they would block it out. Anyway, long discussion. Long discussion, mm. yes. yes. Just for uh, pushing this change of, of model, uh, majority of the TV services that we will see in the future will not be broadcasted over the air. This is my guess. I mean, we are seeing a significant increase in the amount of, of video traffic in the Internet. So uh, the revenue per megahertz uh, use uh, is much lower, in my opinion, in, in broadcasting and in cellular. So. Is Jaime was asking our vision in 2020. My vision, or better my dream, would be that the regulator uh, incentivize the um, uh, efficiency in the use of spectrum for everybody. Uh, and this will be uh, extremely useful, not only for solar, but for, for, for everybody. Today, the, the uh, businesses that are more intensively using the spectrum is the one that are paying more for the spectrum. That is, I don't know if this is uh, a quite fair way, okay? So even without any technological evolution, even without white spaces, uh, we, we Regulator can do many things for having a spectrum used better. I mean, neutrality from technology point of view, uh, a, a significant uh, reordering of, of the spectrum, especially in, in some countries. Uh, there are many things that can be done for make our life easier. Of course, we have to go for small first and we have to improve our network. But uh, only for the spectrum we can have, without any technological uh, improvement, many improvements. Just, I've seen now there's a little misunderstanding. I mean, yes, the revenue generated with the wireless spectrum in general is probably by orders of magnitude above the one of the broadcasting, there's no doubt about this, but the, the one who fight for the spectrum is you, and you have to offer flat rates. That's a problem. If you're on the value chain, if you're Facebook, if you're LinkedIn, if you're YouTube, etc., I agree. Then, then yes, but these are not the ones who pay directly for that uh, type of spectrum. And this is a problem. Is what I also mentioned in my, my talk. You know, if you could link that, uh, then you know there's no further discussion about this. But uh, voila, that's the situation. Thank you very much for your comments. I mean, my personal view about about the spectrum in the in the future. I think building on top of what Robert mentioned before, uh, I think 
for example, uh, mobile TV, we have tried to make it work many times and, and it has never uh, shown a, a profitable business case for, for because we are trying to, to deliver mobile on, on a spectrum that is for, so mobile TV for a spectrum that is for wireless communications and, and mobile communications purely. Now the question is whether if traffic is moving towards more, inter, more internet based TV traffic, like we are seeing with phenomena like YouTube, like Netflix, and all these kind of things, uh, whether a more efficient usage of the mobile TV spec of the TV spectrum, not only by means of wide spaces, but by means of, of, of wireless communications, to be enabled to deliver more efficiently uh, the, 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 the TV traffic and the TV signals using the infrastructure that is already out there for, from, from, from the mobile networks would be a, a, a good opportunity or a better opportunity for the, for the next years to come. So uh, continuing with this topic about the spectrum, uh, before we move to another topic, I want to open the, the, the question to the floor where there are some questions or comments. There's a comment there after. Yeah, David Barker, Quintel Technology. Um, just on the Shannon limit, um, it's interesting that we're also arriving at a MIMO limit. Um, the, the handset here can only accommodate two, two polarizations, two antennas. Um, I can't fit any more into, into the device. Um, so we're, we're hitting a limit there. Um, an interesting um, idea which has come out of the University of Bristol is the idea of, Jaime, you're a few meters away from me, you're receiving also from the base station a different spatial channel, okay? So you'll download some data for me, I'll download some data, other people will, but on a terahertz link or a millimeter wavelength, you will communicate back. So what I'm doing is I'm using traditional infrastructure, let's say 2600 uh, megahertz, but rather than adding more spectrum or more power, I'm actually using more spatial layers. So effectively I could have 16 by 16 MIMO. So I'm being spectrally efficient I can get very high data rates through this, but you're all cooperating to help me. And likewise, I'll help you as well. It doesn't have to be handsets, it could be nodes, a little bit like the relay node, but rather than a coverage extension, you know, bending around for, for line of sight, it's providing spatial layer multiplexing. So I don't know if any of you guys have come across a technique like this um, for, for solving the, the, the many gigabits per second. Yeah, actually, I did my PhD on that, and uh, Mark Beach happened to be my um, PhD uh, revisor, uh, you know, at the end of the whole game. So I, uh, we know, I know very well about that, and uh, what I, I mean, that is cooperative communications, essentially, which uh, a lot of our community is working on, um, for the good or the worse, we'll see, I don't know. Um, I was very passionate about that type of technique. Um, it has cooled down significantly, having spent a few years at France Telecom, because I can tell you that operators don't like this type of ad hoc uh, networking with not guaranteed servicing. Um, you know, there's a little bit of statistics in there. This is something they don't like. Then how do you do the the device to device communication, you know, there's do you use the in band, out band channels interference? So, you know, it comes down to the tr practical problems. Having said this, it's just taken off right now. So, release 11, most likely, you will have it. Uh, you know, it's uh, people know about it. It gives probably a factor. If you, if, you, if you really do the balance sheet at the end, up to the system, et cetera, maybe a factor of two, probably, if you're very optimistic. So it gives a it gives performance gain, so people are there for working on that, and I think it will it will enter the cellular standardization eventually. Yeah, if you do it out of channel, that is that is a good thing to do. Yes. Thanks. All right, Jonathan Smith, University of Pennsylvania. So I have a question. I mean, very interesting set of discussions. Um, I'm interested in the kind of co-evolution of Wi-Fi in the home and office and the cellular, which is more, more global. And I'm, I'm wondering how people are thinking about that because, um, you know, th there was some discussion about the home. Uh, but, I, you know, I, I, I've done a few surveys basically setting up my laptop and wandering around Barcelona. And uh, it's very interesting. There's an enormous number 
of Wi-Fi access points. There's massive over-provisioning of these edge wireless connectivity solutions, and uh, there were ideas that popped up like spectrum sharing and um, multi-carrier spectrum sharing and things like that. And I'm wondering, you know, d does anyone see any opportunities for rethinking the home environment, or is that just basically the computer industry doing what it wants? I think this um, super dense network concept that we presented, um, I think could definitely compete even in the home market, even though um, we probably have mainly um, corporate building airports, shopping malls and so in mind. But in principle, it could definitely also be deployed at home. And I think the differentiators to wireless LAN would be, my personal experience with wireless LAN is it works great if um, you're alone, but as soon as, um, the multiple user, the performance really degrades because I think then you see this kind of um, contention-based um, access mechanism when you have high load that they don't work that great anymore. And I think also yet another advantage could be if you would improve um, integration with um, the 3GPP core network so that you get um, seamless mobility even between, um, in this case, hopefully super dense networks and um, uh, 3G or 4G networks. I'm very positive here, but I think the potential is there. And we have seen this convergence between an IEEE and 3GBB community before, which is WiMAX and uh, 3G. They're very, very similar. And I think 4G will be very close and 5G, 6G, Wi-Fi will probably be part of the game. Thank you. Yeah, just one tiny comment. I think so I agree with Misha that uh, in terms of the federated authentication, uh, federated billing across cellular as well as any kind of Wi-Fi clouds, that will happen much sooner than uh, uh, I can even imagine because the push is already there mm -hmm. in the marketplace. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much for the comment. Any further question from the audience? Well, if not, I think we are now almost over time. So before finishing, I would like to say thank you very much for to the speakers for this interesting presentation and and this interesting debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is now a